November 30th, 2018, a day that began like any other. Until the moment. Let's, you guys, let's get out of here. Everything changed. Let's get out of here. You guys, let's get out. Everybody outside. A 7.1 magnitude earthquake jolts South Central, causing panic Man, I gotta get my son. and devastation. The earthquake damage here was seen around the world. Dramatic video tonight of this morning's earthquake. Followed by months of recovery. When the earthquake hit, our world changed completely. It's the day the earth shook. Even the footage doesn't do it justice because the room is literally going side to side and you can feel it. And didn't seem to stop. We have seen probably more than a dozen aftershocks at this point from yeah. the initial quake. From dire warnings to lessons learned. Again, if you're in a safe spot, your gas is turned off in your home, there's no immediate threat in your home, even if the power's out, that is still the safest place for mm -hmm. you. Now, five years later, Alaska's news source revisits the quake's destruction, its impacts, and what you can do to be better prepared for the next one. It is a day to not forget. If you were in South Central Alaska five years ago today, you likely remember the exact moment the quake hit, where you were, what you were doing, who you were with, and who you were separated from. It was a tough day, but a day important lessons were learned that will hopefully be passed on to generations to come. Now over the next 30 minutes, we'll look back at the impacts to the lessons we learned, how much better prepared we are today, and how much more work needs to be done. It was a quiet Friday morning in South Central Alaska. The sun still down and fresh snow was on the ground. People just getting the day started when everything changed. Man, I gotta get to my son. The largest quake to hit South Central since 1964. Not a drill this time. Practice became reality for survival. Oh my God. Searching for protection seconds, feeling like minutes. Drop, cover, hold on, and wait. For some, it was an instinct to run. Confusion, fear, and adrenaline all kicking in. It's an earthquake. The power was out. And phone lines were down, but limited information started coming in. The quake initially confirmed as a 7.0, a tsunami warning issued for the coast. And the ground was still moving. Seven major aftershocks, including a 5.7, just minutes later. 45 additional quakes of magnitude 4.0 or higher in total, at least 300 aftershocks felt in the following days and weeks, each one bringing us right back to 8.29 a.m. The streets were gridlocked with people trying to get across town to their loved ones. Every single school does have some type of damage. In the following hours, reports of the damage started coming in. Roads caved to the shock taking cars with them. Some hillsides couldn't hold up to the shaking. And I was just running around trying to find a way out. Homes and buildings suffering major damage with people inside. <sighs> definitely made me think a little bit more about my life. Um, definitely don't take your life for granted because if I was anywhere else in this house, it could have been completely different <laughs> anywhere else. As families were putting their homes back together, First responders were out fighting fires and helping with medical emergencies. Some injuries, but no deaths. It was like something out of a movie. I called my mom, I was like, yo mom, it was an earthquake, I love you. They said it's a tsunami. I was all, you know, hysterical, of course, breathing all heavy. It was crazy, I called 911 immediately. Like, yo, the house, uh, the, the church is on fire. As the hours went on, more help arrived with many caring for children separated from their parents. Wait! Thanks, Ralph. They're tricking me. Grocery stores became full and the shelves empty as the search for water and food began. 
And in the years to come, scientists from around the world would flock to Anchorage to study this powerful quake, rupturing 10 miles high, 12 miles wide, inside a subducting plate, 35 miles below the Earth's surface, just seven miles north of downtown Anchorage. It's rare that you get such a dense urban seismic network of strong motion instruments in a city like Anchorage that records a big magnitude seven earthquake like that. And now, five years later, there are little signs this quake ever happened. The roads and damaged buildings are rebuilt, land restored, but the memory stays the same, and the lessons have been learned. When disaster strikes, what matters most is, of course, not the material things. It's the safety of our loved ones and the people we're with. On November 30th, 2018, it wasn't just the resilience of Alaskans on display. It was their kindness and compassion. Eric Soul shows us how the community came together. The biggest lesson learned for Anchorage Fire Department is we have to be better prepared to handle the circumstances post-earthquake. But first responders weren't the only ones who jumped into action that day. Day morning of the earthquake, um, I actually was on J Bear. If you were here five years ago, you have your story. So I had an experience that was a little different from a lot of people because I was outside. About where you were. Literally, we were taxiing down the runway. Um, and I remember feeling like the, the plane was um, sliding on ice or something. And how you reacted. And then the earth shook and I grabbed a sign and the power flickered behind me. Worrying, wondering if everyone was okay. And I remember driving back from J Bear um, into Anchorage and seeing all of the traffic, all of the cars, people wanting to get home and thinking, oh my gosh, uh, nothing like this has ever happened in my lifetime in, in Anchorage. We checked on our families, our neighbors, but some had bigger responsibilities. I'm Jenny Ragland. I work for the Salvation Army in Alaska, and my job title is Service Extension and Emergency Disaster Services Director. So my name is Bill Falsey. I was the Anchorage Municipal Manager and part of the response to the 2018 earthquake. They jumped into action. If I have a job to do, um, people are going to be in need. Five years ago, I came directly from dropping off my children at preschool and then spent probably the next three days at this building. They had practiced for this. We were off to the races within half an hour, I would say. The city pulled together. They had to. We realized pretty quickly that Anchorage is something of an island, and so in terms of emergency response, which meant that the initial response was going to be one that we fielded. We were all frightened. We had more calls into 911 in the first four hours than we typically receive in an entire day. But we were in good hands. I don't know that any of us thought that by the end of the second day we would be saying the lights are generally on, communications are generally up, and you can drive from any point A to any other point B in town. The damage could be repaired, but we were shaken. There was probably more emotional um, and mental health needs that we saw as a result of that. The big lesson to be learned, we already knew it. I think it reinforced to us the importance of preparedness and investing in the people, systems, and teams that we don't need often, but that we critically need when we do need them. Eric Soule, Alaska's News Source. Live right now on alaskasnewsource.com, we've posted an extended version of Eric's conversation, along with other new videos, interviews, and resources to help you better prepare for the next earthquake. If you grew up in Alaska, you likely learned that during an earthquake, you should get to a doorway because it was safer. That may have been good practice then, but now it's likely just a hole cut in the drywall. So what should you do in the event of an earthquake? Well, that depends largely on where you are. One fundamental rule though, wherever you are, stay there. So if the shaking wakes you while you're in bed, the best thing to do is stay there and cover your head with a pillow. Find a sturdy piece of furniture that you can get underneath. And if that's not possible, crouch next to a piece of furniture and make sure to cover your head. And also, steer clear of windows and any objects that might fall on you. From then, it's just the basic rule of drop, cover, and hold on. 
If you're outside, stay outside and stay away from trees and power lines. If you're in your car, stay there and try to get off or away from bridges if it's safe to do so. Remember, the biggest danger in an earthquake is from falling or flying objects. Still ahead, the sudden shaking wasn't the only surprise of the day. There were no fatalities, only minimal injuries. We should be thankful that it was only stuff that got broken and not people. Following the earthquake, Alaska quickly became an example in the world of infrastructure. Our investigative team will take a look at the state's earthquake systems when we return. Scary day for Alaskans. The earthquakes in the past, this one was different. This was very, very scary damage that we don't fully understand. There are other areas of the world where a magnitude 7.1 earthquake would have brought whole cities crumbling. In fact, there have been instances where earthquakes of lesser magnitudes have killed hundreds. But in Alaska, that was not the case. And look at how fast we got back on our feet, right? Just a few days, roads were repaired, things were functional, utilities were back online. And when you compare that to a, a 7.2 or a 7.4 earthquake anywhere else in the world, uh, you know, it, it's a matter of counting how many people died and, you know, how many months or years it's going to take to get back to normal. The damage was bad, but it could have been so much worse. There are, however, still concerns that structural problems exist. Rebecca Palsha investigates where that system is. In the days and the weeks after the earthquake, Alaskans reflected on what worked and what failed. In a city as large as Anchorage, in a state that has an earthquake every 15 minutes, when the big ones happen, we all remember the cracks, the swaying, the cleaning, and the fear of aftershocks. No one wants to experience it again. But did we make any changes to improve safety? Are we in a better place now than we were then? I don't think so, because nothing has really changed in those five years. The repairs were made, but as far as improving building codes or inspections... So we were not any safer today than we were five years ago? No lessons were learned? If they have been, it's not by changes of code. It's maybe changes of practice of the people. But in one very important way, the Port of Alaska says the quake backed up what it has said all along. There was a lot of concerns about how the corroded wharf piles would respond uh, and they did exactly what everybody was afraid they were going to do. Uh, not enough to bring the facility out of service but enough to get our attention for certain that uh, if we didn't think we had evidence that we needed to do a modernization program which is really replace all the docks that was certainly validated by that. The Port of Alaska director says there were no seismic standards on the docks when they were originally constructed. And that kind of situation would not be permitted today. That's led to an expansive modernization program for a place that handles 3.9 million tons of fuel and cargo in 2018. We are still talking about it somewhere in the neighborhood of 1.8 to $2 billion. We're not far enough along in the design work to have any, any more of a degree of certainty than just that at this stage of the game. Engineers also say that as new buildings are constructed in Anchorage, building owners now proactively look to improve safety. We have owners coming in and asking us not only to design new buildings, but what we're seeing is people asking us to upgrade their existing buildings. Previous codes were not as strict. We didn't know as much about engineering. We didn't know as much about earthquakes, say, 50 years ago. And it's not required for owners to upgrade to make their building more resilient, but they are wanting to. So what we're seeing is more voluntary upgrades of existing buildings. That's the positive side, but remember upgrades are not required. But what concerns me or keeps me up at night, if you will, is the older buildings that were designed under previous codes, which means they were designed for le likely less load and their detailing is different, which means how exactly the structural members are put together. We just didn't know as much as a, as a community 50 years ago, 40 years ago even. So that, that's what concerns me the most. What keeps the port director up at night? worrying about what might happen if an even larger or longer quake occurs before repairs. I couldn't tell you what would be left. 
here sure. when it was over. I mean, we're, we're that close. So yeah, having to wait till 2028 or so before we have another new cargo dock that has the same structural integrity as the new petroleum cement terminal, yeah, that gives you pause. The Anchorage School District is another group making upgrades. That one actually fell and hit the locker. That need became clear after the quake when there were huge problems like this. Yeah. ASD says since the quake, it's assessing all of its 92 buildings, which include more than 4,000 classroom spaces. And so they're a client that has said, you know, we don't have to upgrade our buildings, but we have buildings from the 60s, 70s, 80s, mm -hmm. and we know we can do better, you know, frankly, for the kids and the, the people in the building. Yeah. So they've chosen to do it. But is it a choice others can afford to make? One day, we may find out. We all have the best intentions. How many of us, after that 7.1 earthquake, said, I'm going to build an emergency kit? But did you? Really? I get it, it can be overwhelming and a little bit intimidating, but keep this phrase in mind, good, better, best. It doesn't have to be perfect, but let's get some basics going. We're gonna start with water. You need one gallon per person per day. You can use tap water, just replace it every six months. For food, you don't need fancy freeze-dried food. Put the stuff that you like in your kit. Also, remember your pantry is a good source for backup food supplies. A first aid kit. Get one of these, put it with your water so you know exactly where it's at. The next one's a little more difficult for some, but find an alternate heating source. Firewood, a wood stove, maybe a generator. Something to keep you warm if the power goes out. And some hygiene products because you're going to get dirty and you're going to need this. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it is a good place to start. Go to alaskasnewsource.com. We've got links to the list for everything you need in your emergency kit, plus a plan to build the kit slowly so it's not quite so overwhelming. And check out our digital exclusive with Jeremy Zedek with the Alaska Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Management about emergency kits and how having a kit increases your chance of staying in your home. You can find that on alaskasnewsource.com. While five years have gone by, there's no doubt Alaskans who experienced this quake will never forget that day and the lessons that came with it. Did you learn any lessons from that day? Sleep with full pajamas. <laughs> I'm sure everybody does that now though. <laughs> from families who fled their homes to houses crumbling. Coming up next, we'll have a look at some of the most memorable moments brought on by the quake. Sitting down in at the table and we're just coloring and all of a sudden I started hearing a noise before I felt the shaking. And a family frightened for their life, reuniting in a tight embrace. It was video that went viral in the weeks and months following the 2018 earthquake. So many of us have stories about where we were and what we were doing when the earthquake struck. And there was a lot of video that circulated from that day, but some stands out more than others. Or Maxwell looks back to two of the most memorable moments. Some people ran as the walls around them shook. Scary, my adrenaline was pumping. I was terrified because I thought that the house was gonna collapse on me. So I just started sprinting. The November 30th earthquake did much more than break apart roads and crack house foundations. It fractured our sense of security. It was definitely scary, not knowing what to do. Tony Skilja and his wife, Jennifer. The only thought in my head was to get to Sophia and Tony and just get downstairs if you, if you can. Are the young couple in this home security video grabbing their daughter, Sophia, and escaping their home barefoot in the snow? Imagine the relief that came with that hug. Right when I got out the door and I was with Tony and Sophia, I was just crying. From crying to laughing. My very first thought at that point was, oh, phew, good, it's just an earthquake. Homer resident Tomasz Szelczynski and a friend were on the Minnesota off-ramp heading to the airport when the road started crumbling around them. And then, like, I realized how bad it was and like, oh, it's really an earthquake. <laughs> Five years later, it's a great story, but at the time... Yeah, it was a little scary. 
If his car had been thrown just a little further to the right. Yeah, that the way that was positioned, if I had gone off like in, on that side, we probably wouldn't have made it. Solchinsky says he's not a religious man. Even though I'm atheist, I still think um, I, I have a guardian angel that watches over me. But he knows he got lucky that day. Not only did he get his car back, he also made his flight. Lauren Maxwell, Alaska's News Source. On November 30th, 2018, many of our phones, TVs, and radios sounded an alarm warning of a potential tsunami. But how do you know if that warning is for you? I sat down with Dave Snyder with the National Tsunami Warning Center to find out why that warning was issued and what we should do next time. Let's go back to November 30th, 2018. Initial reports coming in. It was a magnitude 7.0 under, under somewhere near Point McKenzie. Tsunami warning was issued pretty quickly, I believe. Yes. Why was that warning issued that day? Uh, the main threat for that, as we knew it, was that there was violent ground shaking that may have moved water. What we weren't sure about at that point was, could there be a landslide in Cook Inlet under the water that would disrupt enough water to move that up into population centers that would create a tsunami. Okay, now since that day, more research has been done for that upper Cook Inlet to know how water will move and respond right. to a large Pacific earthquake. How has that research changed what we know about Anchorage's tsunami risk today? Sure, I think it's important to say that those two earthquakes are different types of events. So the event that we experienced in 2018, very close to Anchorage, is not the same one that's supported by the new research for the Upper Cook Inlet, for the Kenai Peninsula Borough, for the Matsu, and for Anchorage as well. The one we're talking about from the more recent um, research is more of a subduction zone earthquake, one that has a significant thrusting event and, and uh, moving a great deal of water up into the inlet from the south to the north, along and coinciding with high tide. Whereas the other event that we experienced in 2018 was a completely different type of mechanism faulting and doesn't move water the same way and certainly isn't positioned to move that great amount of water in the same way. Now, should we get a repeat event, whether it's the 7.0 scenario like what we saw in 2018 mm -hmm. or something closer to like what we saw in 1964, right. you have your phone and it starts blowing up and yeah. everyone kind of your heart stops and you, sure. you know, get nervous. What does this mean? I have a tsunami warning. And you could be anywhere in Anchorage, you could be in Palmer, you could be in Girdwood. How do you know if that's important information for you? If you can look over your shoulder and see that you're close to the ocean water, that's a really good sign that you need to move to high ground if you get that a warning. Uh, what I would say to everybody is, if you get a tsunami warning in your location, the first thing to do is treat it like it's for you. Act like it is for you being sent to you on purpose. Move out of the way, move to high ground, 100 feet up, one mile in is always a good rule of thumb. Okay. Get away from the water. Then get more information. Places that I'd worry about here in Anchorage would be the Tony Knowles Coastal Trail, right? If I'm down there next to the water, can see the water, and you get a tsunami alert, take that seriously. Move to high ground. But places that you don't have to worry about. You know, if you're shopping at the mall, if you're downtown, uh, you know, on, on 4th or 5th Avenue, you know, Kincaid Park, most of those, those hills and those trails are okay. But if you're down next to the water, that's not okay. And the same goes for Matsu and the Kenai Peninsula. There's, there's a lot of low spots there. The hay flats are some of those that we drive across every single day. Places down toward Girdwood. Uh, there could be some inundation zones there that uh, you know, we need to pay better attention to now. Now, for our Pacific coastal communities, places like Seward, Homer, Kodiak, mm -hmm. they not only have seen real-life examples of large tsunamis impacting their communities, right. uh, but they get those regular warning tests that they do mm -hmm. weekly and monthly. They sort of prepare for this. They have the drills. Right. But they also get the real-life drills, so to speak, where maybe they have to evacuate, but they never see any waves. Right. What would you say to those people in those communities that go, come on, these are all false alarms. When are, are we ever going to see a real tsunami? Do I really need to evacuate every time? What we do know is that all of those events have produced a tsunami. They have not been large impactful tsunamis that have damaged communities and coastlines, but they have been enough to measure on official sensors. And we don't do a good job of finishing that story and telling you, hey, Melissa, guess what? There actually was a tsunami with that. And here's the information. Tell everybody you know. 
And I think if we did that uh, and more effectively, people would understand that there was a reason that we woke you up at 2 o'clock in the morning, and we weren't kidding. All right. Good information. I think it's important for us to remember what we learned in 2018. So we're hopefully prepared next time. It's not so much of a shock. Uh, and we all come out uh, from this real danger that we have here in Alaska together safely. Yes, definitely. And yeah, if I would say anything else, it would just be that uh, it's important to practice the plan, right? Talk about what you're going to do with your family tonight. Just discuss what that plan is, where you're going to meet, how you're going to reconnect, because in a large eventful earthquake, our communication systems are going to be struggling. We all remember that from 2018. Yeah. And having a way around that and a better plan because you experienced that is the next first step. If you're a podcast listener, you can listen to the full interview with Dave Snyder on our Alaska's News Source podcast. Just point your phone at the QR code on the screen and it will take you to the Alaska's News Source podcast page. You can download, like, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. And you can head to our website, alaskasnewsource.com, to find the tsunami inundation maps for your area and to view our full tsunami series we did earlier this year, The Risk Defined. As we conclude this special presentation from Alaska's News Source, we hope you take the time to prepare and plan for future earthquakes and tsunamis. For the entire team, I'm Chief Meteorologist Melissa Fry. Thank you for watching.